Hey guys, welcome to the Convo Couch. Today we've got Brayden Palmer, actor and writer. Thank you for coming on the Convo Couch today. Thank you for having me. Like, how did you get started? How did I get started? Yes. Uh, so I'd always wanted to be an actor. Like I'd always sort of played around on, um, on my bed and just jumping around, pretending to be Harry Potter and that sort of thing. Um, but I'd never had the... I guess the courage or the confidence to sort of go for it and put myself out there. Like there would be school plays. I remember like even when I was, I was 15 and, and a friend of mine was in the school play. Uh, it was uh, Little Shop of Horrors. And just, just watching him up there, I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I was so proud of him, but I could never do that. I could never get up there and do that. And it wasn't until I was about 20, sort of the end of 2015 where I got to the point where it was just consuming me. I just had to do something. It was like this anxiety just building up of not, not performing, not, uh, you know, I'd, I'd walk around the house and, uh, pretend to be the Joker and do the voice and, and Matthew McConaughey and, and just come up with scenes in my head and act them out by myself and just practice. But that can only get you so far. That can only, stimulate you so much so it was sort of got to the point where I was like I have to let this out and so I just booked two courses like that I was like all right well I have to do it now I've paid the money I have to go and do it so that kind of is what started it all why do you think it took so long for you to I guess embrace it to embrace it yeah um well I've always had anxiety growing up so I think to kind of, you know, to act, you've got to be really vulnerable. You know, mm. you've got, you've got to, it's, it's that weird kind of contra contradiction. You've got to have, you know, thick skin and deal with the rejection that's always going to come in this industry. And at the same time, you've got to be willing to open yourself up like that. Um, you know, you have scenes where you've got to, you know, tell someone you love them and ball out crying and all that sort of thing. So you've got to find that within yourself. And to do that in front of people and have them judge that, you know, whether they say they're not going to or what, everyone has judgments. Everyone's going to have some sort of point of view, whether they share it or not. And so to do that in front of people and have them think something of me was terrifying. Um, so I, ju I just, I, I couldn't do it. I, I just... I just couldn't, it just filled me with too much anxiety. And it was sort of, I guess, a progression of things. Like I would always, um, you know, do voices and stuff like that and, and kind of perform in front of my family, which was pretty much what I was doing, was performing, you know, coming up with crazy characters and just being an idiot in front of them. Um, and I had to do some public speaking when I was 17 or 18. And I had to speak at a Anzac Day ceremony. Um, and so that terrified me doing that. But that was kind of the first step of starting to put myself out there, starting to put my thoughts out there, starting to use my voice a little bit. Is anyone in your family creative? Like... Uh, so my auntie and uncle are a big influence on me. My uncle's a creative director. Uh, he does a lot of freelance stuff in London he did the uh, rebranding for Doctor Who and um, BBC and ITV and all that sort of stuff so, and he's an animator and a director so he has he's always had that um, very very creative side he's far more creative than me far more skilled and t talented than I'll ever be and I he growing up he actually used to make movies um, which I then tried to do but nothing compared to what he did he did claymation movies and there was one that I used to watch so often that my my mum actually had to, it was back in the day with VHS and, and all that sort of thing. So she was like, okay, we need to make this into a DVD because otherwise you're going to destroy the, the VHS and it's going to be gone forever. So, um, yeah, so she converted to, and because I just used to watch it all the time because I thought it was incredible. And my auntie as well, she's very creative. She's... Um, she used to tell us stories and come up with these characters and, and do these voices and just, they both just allowed us to be, um, and I say us, I mean my sister as well, um, allowed us to be silly and, and just 
use our imagination and let it run wild. So I guess that's always been there with me. All right, so you're the youngest in the family, are you? Yeah, okay. yeah, youngest of two. Okay. Um, so I'm the annoying little brother, and I think I think that's helped me with my um... antics and uh, performances. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've had I've, I've had someone to sort of you know be my audience, so it's good. Yeah, um, and you mentioned as well you like I guess character acting. I mean, you mentioned the Joker, Matthew McConaughey voices. So is that like your type of acting, the style of acting? Um, I always try to just add a little something so I do sort of look really deep into the character and understanding what makes him tick and, and look at the physicality look at the voice um the background you know the history I, I sort of you know all the stuff I do I have in you know, pages and pages of notes and you know of just random little facts I come up with for this character and um so I always try and add a little something to the character that makes them unique so whether it's just a slight change in the voice a slight change in the movement, um, you know, uh, one I did earlier in the year, um, I was playing an alien drug lord, uh, pimp kind of character, very, um, very vile and it was so much fun. Um, okay. and, and so I sort of changed my voice a little bit with that and used my hands quite a bit, which I do normally, but just the way that I've used my hands, I did this a lot and that sort of thing. So just adding bits and pieces. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with, with voices and putting on voices um, like the Joker and uh, Little Britain. I used to like, I used to watch Little Britain growing up and do, you know, Marjorie Dawes and Vicky Pollard and all that sort of thing. That just always, I just love doing that. And I think it was because people used to get annoyed. My family used to get annoyed. So I'd get that reaction and be like, all right, I'll keep going. Yeah. Keep pushing you further. So, that, so that's what drives you, people getting annoyed. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're all not right. annoyed, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of got burnt one too many times in school, but I, I used, I would always use humour as a way to connect with people. So I'd always do voices or funny walks or just be silly to try and just get people to like me. And so often, particularly as I, as I got older as well, you know, going into high school, people would turn away from that because it was too different. It was too weird. Um, so I kind of brought that back down. So I'm a little bit more reserved when I first meet someone um I'm getting better now particularly now that I'm acting I'm a bit more confident and comfortable um but yeah that that was kind of the the, the gauge I guess I used to to work out whether someone liked me or not is if I could make them laugh or or if they could appreciate the voices that I would do and so often they would but it it there was plenty of times where they wouldn't and it would kind of turn them away so you mentioned that one time that you got burned, like... Yeah, I, I, um, I remember, uh, I think I, I put on a, a girl's voice and they just, they, the people around me just looked at me like, oh, what are you, gay? And it was kind of like, all right, I'll just go back in my box. Okay, I'll just sit here. And, yeah. you know, it was kind of like, it, it wasn't the, and I don't want to, you know, being gay, that that to me that's a compliment because my uncle's gay and so if if someone you know says that about me i'm kind of like thank you <laughs> kind of thing because okay. it just I, I i automatically equate that to him and his kind of mannerisms and stuff like that um you know i kind of just attach myself you know i have a very positive look on that i guess um and but obviously when it's used as a negative you can see what they're trying to do with it and yeah. so that would kind of yeah i'll just go all right i'm back in my box yeah, I guess I guess finding your crowd and your friends or your mates like it's dependent a lot on your personality and the kind of yeah. humor that you guys share. So if someone doesn't get your humor, then that's yeah. And and so being I I, I my uncle lives in England, but I've been over there plenty of times by myself and, and stayed with him and, and his husband, and just being around their group and their um you know their creative group and just around all those people who are, you know, he's got a friend who is, who is so camp. It is, he's gorgeous. And I've known him since I was tiny and he's the most beautiful man. And so to be around someone like that, who is so funny and so flamboyant and out there and to love it, it kind of goes, okay, it's, it's okay. And... So what um, 
Well, I mean, I, I think it's, you kind of, I don't know, it's hard. It, it's really hard to, hard to say because I guess my experience is my family, so I'm from Mudgee and my family have grown up there. You know, my parents grew up there. Uh, they still live there. My grandparents live there. I have a lot of family there now. So whenever I go home, it's very, I love going home. I, I love Mudgee so much. And I love my time, like the experience I've had there growing up. It's just an amazing childhood. But I've been very fortunate in the fact that I have a, you know, a, a base there. I have my family still there. I have, you know, some friends still there. A lot of them have sort of moved away, but um, having that support network there, I think that large support network and people I'm very close to, I think um, sort of gave me, you know, well, some people might think, you know, living in the country is very isolating. I found it very nurturing and very comforting. I'm sure you'll be like traveling a lot anyway in your career, like not just staying in Sydney, but you know, going to the UK or going to the US at some stage. I yeah, assume. well, I'm actually I'm going to LA next month. Right. Um, I want a scholarship to study over there for three months. So. Great, congrats. Yeah, it's the Carmen Duncan scholarship with uh, AAFTA. Um, so, yeah, really exciting. Like five weeks now, I think. So it's getting really close. Doing a little calm down. Yeah, yeah. Sort of came the other day. It's like no more work, and then I, you know, I'm going home for a little bit, and then I fly off, and it's, it's exciting. It's nice. it's, it's kind of it's a little bit scary because I mean it's change. It's change is always a little bit confronting, but yeah, I'm really looking. I'm really excited for it. Okay, so it's for you to go over to study for three months. Yeah, yeah, and just um, yeah, just try and grow and. and Which get school do you know, and like what kind of techniques or? Yeah, so it's it's um the American uh, arts. Film and Television Academy. Um, so Jess Orchick is the the one who who's the director of that, um, and Carmen Duncan. You know she was um, you know a, a, a darling of Australian film and television for so many years, and she unfortunately passed away at the beginning of this year. Um, so yeah, I'll be going over there to to stay with them, and they get a whole bunch of teachers in, and, and some really fantastic teachers as well. Um, their course. Um, you, you cover so much, you know, audition technique, um, you know, voice, Alexander's Day, like all, all this stuff that you go through. And so it's really intensive and cover a lot of bases. And hopefully, you know, when I look back, you know, where I'm at now and when I, where I'm at at the end of the year, hopefully there is a huge growth and no doubt there will be. The best advice, and I got this a couple of years ago from a teacher, you know, you sometimes you go into an audition and it might be your only chance to act that week. So just enjoy it. Don't worry about the outcome. You know, will you or will you not get the job? That's not up to you. You know, that's that's up to them. You And, and sometimes it could be something as small as that person has freckles and that person doesn't. Just enjoy the opportunity to stand up in front of someone and just, you know, be vulnerable, be safe, be whoever you want to be and not have to worry about the consequences. I think that's the best thing. And so when, when I went into that audition, I had to do a US accent and um, I just kind of, you know, I did one scene and it, it was a monologue. They were both monologues, um, but one scene was sort of a bit more, you know, authoritative. Um, I was playing a, I think like an army sergeant or something like that. And then, which I, I really don't look like, <laughs> I'm not intimidating at all. Um, but then the next one was, I was, um, you know, t uh, it was sort of a letter, but I was to my wife that I'm not coming home. And so um, Jess, she was the reader um, and she sat down and she just, and she was a fantastic reader as well. And it really helps when you have that, to get that connection. And I kind of just looked at her um, as if she was, you know, my girlfriend at the time and just sort of put that personalization in there and just, just didn't worry about the lines, just didn't worry about anything and just tried to let it all out, let everything out that I was feeling. And I think that really helped me then and that really helped make a statement of just that, you know, being willing to go to that place and willing to relax and willing to, to be there, I think is really important. And that ha that comes when you take that pressure of wanting to get it away. You still gotta have that motivation obviously, because that's how you get that work done. That's how you sit down and do your prep. But when you get there, you let it go. And that's, that's easier said than done, but it's, 
the times when I have done that, I've done my best work and more often than not, I've, I've gotten a, a good result out of it. Okay. When I was 16, I was babysitting my little brother and I had taken all these Percocet and I was unbelievably high. And we went to the park out on Lake Shore and he was running around in his socks through the leaves and I would bury him and he would bury me in the leaves. And then he started running through the leaves, making tracks, you know, and he was shouting out, cold caboose, cold caboose. And then it came time to go home. And I was driving and I drove off a bridge and into the water and I couldn't get him out of his car seat and he drowned. And I struggle with God so much because I can't forgive myself. And to be honest, I don't want to right now. And I don't want to believe in a God that could forgive me. But I'm here and there is nothing controlling me. If, if I hurt someone, I hurt someone and they can forgive me or not, but I can change. I, I do want to be sober. So I just want to say, if, if God makes you look up, I am so happy for you, but if not, you know, Come here. Thank you. <laughs> Great performances that you remember. Heath Ledger's Joker. Mm -hmm. That's the one that really stands out to me. And one, it's like, you know when you always have that movie you wish you could see for the first time again? That's the movie for me. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay.